President Biden is heading to Philadelphia Tuesday to discuss the battle over voting rights. His speech is part of a broader effort by Democrats to fight Republican restrictions to ballot access. Yesterday, Vice President Kamala Harris announced a $25 million investment by the Democratic National Committee for a voting rights initiative. The program will seek to address inequities in ballot access and cut down on burdensome regulations. In an interview airing tonight on BET Networks, Soledad O'Brien asked the vice president about potential compromises on voting rights, including voter ID laws. I don't think that we should underestimate what that could mean. Because in some people's mind, that means, well, you're going to have to um, Xerox or, 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 or photocopy your ID to send it in to prove you are who you are. Well, there are a whole lot of people, especially people who live in rural communities, who don't, there's no Kinko's, there's no Office Max near them. People have to understand that when we're talking about voter ID laws, be clear about who you have in mind and what would be required of them to prove who they are. The vice president also joined President Biden for a meeting with civil rights leaders Thursday to discuss voting restrictions. National Urban League President Mark Morial called Republicans' efforts a danger to democracy. Beginning with the events of June, January 6th at the Capitol and cascading like a tsunami through state legislatures across the nation that have a singular intent, which is to suppress, deny, and thwart the votes of black people, brown people, young people, people who are disabled, and many other Americans who live with great disadvantage in this country. For more, I want to turn to Reverend Dr. William Barber. He is president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Reverend Barber, welcome back to CBSN. You have called for, quote, a season of nonviolent direct action to deal with threats to voting rights. What would that look like? Well, first of all, you see I got my marching shirt on today. It's time to really get out of the ties and the suits and get in the streets. Uh, with the people. And, you know, this is not just about black people, and it is about the entire democracy. And it's not just the Republicans, it's the Republicans and the two Democrats, Cinema and Manchin, who refuse to stand with the other uh, 49 um, uh, Democrats. They could pass what we need to stop what's happening in these state legislatures, and then our vice president could give the, um, the, the deciding vote. What we see happening here is an all-out attack, and it's connected to voting rights. But for the GOP and these others, remember, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is supporting them. So it's the U.S. Chamber of Commerce against the United States Constitution. They see voting suppression as a way to redistribute wealth upward, to control policies that distribute wealth upward. We say it's time now to in engage and uh, 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 push harder. And what that means for us is on this coming Monday, a large coalition of folk of every race, creed, and organization, black and white and otherwise, are going to have a massive national call in. And then on the 19th, on the anniversary of Seneca Fall, women are going to take the street in D.C. and engage in nonviolent moral direct action and civil disobedience. Uh, and then on the 26th, we're going to go in the Senate offices of every senator in this country, Democrat and Republican, and ask them four questions. Do you support stopping the filibuster? Do you support um, the full passage of the For the People's Act? Do you support the full Voting Rights Act? Do you support $15 in the living wage? They say yes. We come out and say the media, they're one of our allies. They say no, the people are going to sit down. And then on August 2nd, we're going to have clergy and poor and low-wage workers of every race, creed, and color come together in D.C. and engage in nonviolent moral direct action. That's what it took to win voting rights. That's what it's going to take to hold on. We've got to shift this whole narrative. Right now, people are thinking it's just about black versus white, just about GOP versus Democrats. Some think it's just about voter ID. No, this is an all-out attack 
on the fundamentals of our democracy, and it has a race uh, uh, character, a class character part of it. It's about economics, and it's about ensuring justice. And we cannot merely have a rally here and there or send an email or send a text. We've got to have mass nonviolent moral uh, direct action. We have to have massive litigation. We have to have meaningful legislation. And we have to have massive voter participation and voter, voter uh, registration. And, Reverend, to your point, as you've specifically been lobbying Democratic Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema to end the filibuster, have you seen any indication that they might budge? Both have strongly indicated they have no intention of ending the filibuster. Do you have confidence that there can be action taken on that issue? Well, they're not going to budge just sitting down with them and having a, a meeting. They've already proven that uh, that doesn't work. What you have to do is do what moves politicians. you got to go in their states. And when we think about it, when they, they were talking and they went into a meeting, Manchin did, and came out and said there was he was a respectful meeting, but he wasn't going to do anything. But the morning after, nearly uh, 800 people in his own state, 80 percent white, uh, people from the hollers and the hood, marched on his Senate office in West Virginia. All of a sudden, the next morning, he comes out with a compromise. Now, we don't accept the compromise because it's not a compromise. And then he starts saying, well, maybe I'm willing to sh shift on the filibuster. None of these folk are going to move without intense pressure because they have too much commitment from the money. Remember, the United, the, 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 the um, uh, 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 Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, actually came out and said they supported Mansion and Cinema. Now, if you really want the other thing we got to do the movement is all these organizations that are talking about the Republicans and all, what we need to do, do also is be challenging their corporate donors to come out and say, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is, this is going to undermine our democracy. And it's not just about the voting rights. It's a, if you undermine voting rights, you suppress voting rights, you're going to suppress living wages and health care and immigrant, immigrant reform and all of the things that we know have to have to happen, especially after the pain of the pandemic, to make it possible for people to have a productive and full life in this country. This is serious business, and we got to make sure we frame it as a moral and constitutional issue. And we need to everybody. We need the older people, the young people, the black folk, the white people, everybody. And if that happens, yes, they'll move. They have to move. They cannot take that kind of pressure. But they're not going to move if we take this as just old normal politics and we just do the tweet and do the email and that's all we engage in or we have a mass rally. No, they're not going to move. They need to face nonviolent direct action, moral direct action. We don't need an insurrection, but we do need a resurrection of, of, of these, of these and, actions. And as you mentioned, there are signs that that message is resonating with corporate America. I want to pivot now, though, to ask you about the economy. Is the U.S. where it needs to be in helping poor Americans recover from the pandemic? Has the Biden administration done enough to enact policies to help poor Americans? Well, no, we, we have not. Twenty-some million people lost their jobs. Eight million more people fell into poverty during the pandemic. We were already at 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country. And still, as we sit here today, 750 people are dying a day from poverty uh, and low wages in, in America. Uh, now, the administration tried to do some things. They, they pushed in their recovery bill, the $15 minimum wage, living wage, which would have raised 40 percent of black people, for instance, out of poverty and low wages, and it would have helped 32 million uh, Americans, many of them who were worked during the pandemic, they were poor low-wage workers, the first to go to work, the first to get infected, the first to get sick, the first to get hospitalized, the first to die. And Manchin blocked that. They blocked that. Uh, if, 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 if the Democrats had held, Kamala Harris would have been able to cast a deciding vote. So there's been a failure uh, not of, 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 the, of, the, of the House, I mean, of the Senate, the Democratic Senate, there's always been a failure of the GOP. And we've got, and the president, what we're saying to him is he's got to continue to push. We also are in talks with him because he has promised to have a meeting with a diverse group of religious leaders and impacted people 
and economists and public health officials to lay out what actually has to happen. And in the Poor People's Campaign, we have put a third re reconstruction vision that's been turned into a congressional resolution right now. It's in the House. It needs to be voted on. Because what it says is, do which Congress people have the resolve to do all the things that are necessary to correct the poverty and low wealth that existed before the pandemic and only exacerbated during and after the pandemic. Reverend Dr. William Barber, thank you for joining us. As always, a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. Forward together, not one step back. It's marching time.